Hello and welcome to another edition of the e-commerce Odyssey podcast. So today we're going to be talking about key financial KPIs or key performance indicators for e-commerce businesses. And I'm very lucky to have here an expert on this who's Ben McAdam from Profits Collective. So Ben, let's just dive straight in. What are the key numbers for your, that matter in your financials? Okay, so there's five big ones and I usually keep it to five big partly because some people are a bit allergic to numbers and they're like, I don't know what all this means. And partly because really it's not that complicated. There are only five and one of them, two of them even are kind of obvious really when you think about it afterwards. So first one, revenue. Revenue is obviously important. If you don't have revenue and if it's not growing, then that's obviously not good for the business. Uh, It doesn't matter what you spend the money on. If there's no money coming in, it's like you don't really have a business without revenue. So we want revenue going up. The one thing I do mention usually there to teach people is to think about the different types of revenue. Like what, what actually makes up your revenue is like, maybe you break it up by product category, or maybe you've, you know, I've only got a a few products and you think about the revenue for each of them separately so that you can see that when your revenue is going up overall or, or going down or sideways overall, you can dig a little bit deeper and see like what's actually causing the movement so that you don't stop selling your best seller because you're only looking at that main overall revenue level. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. Awesome. So, yep. Number two, margins. And this is probably the most important one. Um, if the only thing that you listen to in this podcast is the bit about margins, then I will go to my grave happy if I happen to get hit by a bus in the middle of this episode. Unlikely I'm on the second floor. Yes. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so margins, margins is the difference between what you charge for your product like the list price the price the customer pays and the cost to you for getting that to them so the cost of buying the product or manufacturing the product and the cost of shipping it all the way to the customer from your manufacturer all the way to the customer in my particular version there's variations on what's included in the cost there but the important thing is is if you don't get the ratio between the price and the costs right then it doesn't matter how much you sell you're not going to be profitable. Like you can't outsell a margin problem. So for example, if you had a hundred dollar product and you sold it for $99, well, it's kind of obvious when I put it in those terms is that you sell a bunch of those, you're only going to have a few dollars left to spend on marketing. And it's going to make it difficult to sell if you've got such a a small marketing budget. But if you've got a hundred dollar product and you, it costs you $33 or even $20, well then the difference between those is quite a large amount of money you can spend on marketing to get the sale. It's quite a large amount of you can spend on growing your business or hiring managers or R and D for new products or paying yourself. So the margin is really, really important. <clears throat> and I kind of gave away that if you've got like a three or to five X relationship there, that tends to mean you're okay. If you've only got a 2x relationship, you tend to start overworking somewhere in the mid six figure range because you. What do you mean by overworking? Well, you won't be able to hire help because there's not enough money left over. Um, You'll find that, like, oh, there's a lot of moving parts, a lot of customer service requests, or a lot of dealing with the manufacturers or shipping inquiries and things, a lot of tasks to do as your business grows. And if you've only got a 2x markup, you tend to not be able to hire very good people. To do the work and so you do it yourself thinking oh yeah i've got to grow a business i've got to hustle i've got to you know push through this is just what it's what it's supposed to be like I'm like no no it's not it's really not it's not supposed to be that hard so getting that ratio right can make all the difference between a business that sucks burns you out and sends you broke and you shut it down or a business that can continually bootstrap its own growth from sales does that make sense yeah that makes sense Awesome. Yeah. Shall we move on to number three? Excellent. All right. Number three is marketing. Uh, pretty important. Are you actually spending enough on marketing? I like to think of it like you know, the story of Goldilocks and the three bears. It's kind of a Goldilocks zone where if you spend too little, it's like the porridge being too cold in the Goldilocks story. It's if you spend too little on marketing, there'll be no customers or they won't really be inclined to buy your product when you put it in front of them. Um, whereas if you spend too much on marketing, it means that like you're wasting money. You could have got a better return. It's kind of like the porridge is too hot in the Goldilocks story. So somewhere, you know, there's a range 
Um, and I usually say to people, it's between five and 15% of your revenue. If you use that as a guideline for your marketing budget, mm -hmm. it will make sure it'll make sure you're actually spending something, but not spending so much that you're, you know, you're wasting your money. Is that all clear? Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Fourth one is owner pay. Pretty important is making sure you're actually paying yourself. Um, so that you don't get bored so that you don't go broke. You know, you've got to be able to pay your own personal expenses so that you can focus on building this business. So paying yourself something is important. We don't want to starve the business by pulling all the money out of it because you need to reinvest in stock and in marketing and hiring a team and, and all this stuff. So getting the balance right there with your own pay is pretty important as well. And one, one final important concept to talk about with the owner pay is that you have to be able to pay yourself a market rate for the tasks you're going to delegate later. Because if your business can't afford to pay you a market rate to do them, the business will never be able to afford to pay somebody else a market rate to do it. And you'll be stuck doing those jobs for like below minimum wage sometimes. So making sure the business can afford to pay somebody else when it's not you is a good like canary in the coal mine kind of test to make sure that your margins are okay and you're getting a good return on your marketing. Okay. And then the final, the fifth one, um, these numbers we're talking about are on the profit and loss. And so the fifth number is profit, actually making sure that your business is profitable and that there's some money left over, some profit left over after you've spent uh, some portion of your revenue on paying for stock, paying for marketing, paying yourself, paying your team, paying your overheads that kind of thing, like making sure that the business is actually profitable. If the business isn't profitable, well, then there's something wrong and it needs to be fixed. But also like if the business isn't profitable, you can't pay down debt, you can't build savings, you can't take a distribution as an owner. It's hard for you to fund stock purchases or entice lenders or investors. Like there's a lot of reasons that profit's important. I read a whole blog post on it. Um, even though, you know, profit means tax. Um, I would much rather that I earn a hundred thousand dollars of profit and give away thirty thousand dollars than not earn a hundred thousand dollars in the first place. Um, so profit is important. It's a, a again a bit of a canary in the coal mine kind of a test of like is your pricing right? Are your costs right? Are you getting a good return? And is this business going to work when you when you try and scale it up, or is it just like make some fundamental changes or move on? Kind of a kind of a decision. Okay. Can I, cool? are you finished? Can I ask some questions? Yeah, fire away. Okay. Uh, fire away. So when you talk about uh, margins, what's your, are you talking, uh, forgive me if I'm using the right terminology, here, are you talking about the kind of gross margins or the operating margin? So what would you, what would you include in your margin calculation? Yeah, so I'm very careful about not to use a particular term because everyone has a different idea of what that means. Um, even if you Google some of them. So if you're looking at a profit and loss, it's the gross profit margin on the profit and loss. So that would have your revenue minus your cost of goods sold section. And there'll be a total under which says gross profit. And you divide the gross profit by the revenue. So that's the technical term there. There is, there's a number of other margins. There's contribution margin, which has some extra uh, expenses included. And there's net profit margin, which is the final profit right down the bottom of the profit and loss divided by revenue. So what I tend to include when I'm talking about gross margins and the importance of that three to five X um, relationship is the cost of the product. So you bought it from a manufacturer or you manufactured in house, like all the costs of manufacturing the team and the materials. I'm also including the shipping, any shipping involved all the way up to the point where it arrives at the customer. Mm -hmm. So shipping, shipping raw materials to your site, uh, shipping things from manufacturing to warehouse from warehouse to customer, all of those bits of freight and shipping in there as well. What about the marketing cost? Would that be included at this point? No, not, not when I'm talking about it in, you know, with this three to five X, uh, rule, because, um, if you kind of lump them together, you can't really tell which one needs to be fixed. Okay. So the three to five times, is that for, do you work mainly with D to C customers? Uh, like brand owners or do you work with retailers because uh, three to five yeah. times is quite hard if you're you know you wouldn't get that if you're a retailer but you might if you're d2c 
Oh yes, retail sucks. Uh, it's very hard. My respect to anybody who's involved in retail. Um, landlords suck the life out of you. Um, generally, yeah, D to Z people who are either selling off Amazon or they have their own website and their own audience and marketing channels and email list that they're selling direct to customers. I tend to find that that sucks less. Um, because there's, yeah, you can have better margins, which means more money available for marketing, more money to pay yourself, more money to bootstrap a bigger stock order next time, all that kind of stuff. Okay. Um, what about, okay, so we've talked about the, the key numbers. What are the simple ways to improve these numbers? Simple what do you, ways to improve yeah. <clears throat> Okay, so revenue. Uh, simple one is to improve your marketing. So getting a better return on your marketing, um, which will we'll lump revenue and marketing together here. Uh, simple ways to improve it. So improving, the, basically map out the different stages of your marketing funnel, like how someone goes from knowing nothing about you to buying from you. Look at each of the stages that are involved in there, compare them to benchmarks. There's tons of them you can Google. Compared the different stages to benchmarks, find the one that, that is the furthest away from the benchmark and then laser focus on improving that particular one. The reason why I'm suggesting this is because everybody has their own area of preference in business. So for some people it's marketing, like getting traffic to a website or Amazon ads to get people to a listing. Or some people like sales, which is, you know, you've got the eyeballs right there in front of the product, how do you convert them on the page? for example, um, or some people like stock sourcing or operations or managing a team, like everyone has their own area of preference. And that is the same for your marketing funnel as well. Like there's different areas of the marketing funnel that you naturally think are important because, you know, that's the area of marketing you worked in before you had your own business or you heard a great blog post about a particular bit or whatever. So if you're able to map out the whole thing, compare it to benchmarks, you'll actually see the bit that's possibly in your blind side that you can't actually see or you don't normally pay attention to that has a lot of potential to improve the revenue of your business. If you just work on that a little bit. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. So what about, um, so if you can, I don't want to cut you off. I've, I've been told by people I cut people off. So you finished on no, that point. I, I, I'm done. It's look, done. Looking at, okay. So, what about uh, reporting? Because I've always found it really, really, you know, really hard with e-commerce to get the reporting right because you've got so many, you know, my, I run a retail business, one of the ones you don't like, and, and it is hard. And yeah. um, so we sell on about kind of 20 different channels and we sell in about five different currencies and we sell in lots of different countries and the reporting has been a nightmare, always a nightmare and it yeah. continues to be a nightmare. Have you got any tips on how to improve reporting? Or to get um, to get to get to these figures more without killing yourself. <laughs> well, <clears throat> to be honest, uh, there's a there's a book with a wonderful title. It's called "Eat That Frog," um, which is like you just kind of. I, what's the myth? It's like if you if the first thing that you do each day is eat a frog, then nothing in the rest of the day is going to seem that bad, kind of thing. So like it, it's the idea of like doing the awful thing first. Right. Um, I, I think it is worth getting the reporting right because with so many variables in your particular situation, you know, 20, 20 different th things, five different that, and then three different that. It's like there's so many of those options. A bunch of those probably suck and you should stop doing them because they're losing you money, like some combinations or some currencies or, or whatever. Um, and there are some that are probably like doing pretty well and you're not paying attention to that. Um, and not doubling down on that, you know, it could be, you know, another million or a couple of million in revenue for you. If just that ability to focus on what's working and to stop wasting time on the things that aren't. So it, it, in your situation, it probably will be hard to get the reporting. And I think the best I can do is like try and motivate you to do it um, and encourage you to do it, to, to walk through it all. You can get a professional to help you with it, to dig into what kind of reporting you already have access to. Maybe it's just a matter of like dumping it all into some spreadsheets, doing some clever things with formulas, then ta-da, you've got the report. Um, 
that might be something we can talk about after a recording. I might be able to give you some ideas if you like. Um, I don't want to deal, delve into your confidential stuff. No, no. On the podcast. Um, but yeah, there's probably some things that you can already uh, already do. And then you just hire a data analyst. Like there's some fairly cheap people on Upwork for like less than 15 US dollars an hour um, that you can say, hey, I have this data. I want to know which of these products or currencies or locations is performing well and which is not performing well. How are you going to do it? And <laughs> you just make it their problem. Um, there's some very clever people out there. So I think this brings us neatly onto the next question is what kind of help do you think businesses should get? So what kind of, you know, the, there's different roles and what the, the, the different financial roles, perhaps you could go for the different roles, even give us a little pitch about what you do at this point. Um, <laughs> what would you recommend? How do you fit in? How does your business fit in with all this stuff? Sure. Yeah. Um, I will just warn people who are expecting a pitch. I don't generally pitch. I find that if I help people, the right customers will seek me out. Um, and, uh, and we'll work together and it's wonderful. So, but to give people an idea of the kind of help that's available around their numbers, there's assembling the numbers, building reports from the numbers, and then there's giving you advice on the numbers and helping you make decisions uh, about the numbers. So in assembling the numbers, there's virtual assistants, admin assistants, spouses, cousins, nephews, nieces, friends, and uh, bookkeepers. Mm-hmm. Um, other kind of people that usually take the information and put it into a spreadsheet or, you know, they take bank statement lines or they take receipts or paperwork and they put it into a bookkeeping system or a spreadsheet of some sort, um, that you can find, um, them all over the internet. Um, there's, you know, the good ones are Googleable because they're good enough that they earn enough money to invest in SEO and to improve their rankings in the Google search engine. So it's an interesting way to judge like how good a bookkeeping company is. Um, I, I'm, I'm saying this partly tongue in cheek, just to mm-hmm. do it, touch back to the margin. I'm like, don't Google a bookkeeping company, get a referral. Um, but yeah, they can help you assemble the numbers. And sometimes those people can help you put together this custom information as well, not just putting together the financials that your tax accountant needs to lodge your tax returns, which brings me to the next person that you have on your team is an accountant or tax accountant. And so for most businesses, a tax accountant, it's basically their job to keep you out of trouble with the tax department in whatever country you're in, uh, HMRC, Australian tax office, the IRS, whatever. Um, they do all the lodgements, make sure you're doing all the lodgements on time. It's their job to nag you. It's their job to get the information from you, assemble the return, check it with you, file it, give you advice on like, hey, you know, if you did this differently, you'd save you a bit of tax. That's what a tax accountant does. Some of them also try and give you advice and they have no qualifications or experience to do so. And it makes me very cross when I hear that some tax accounts have been giving very bad advice just because they've heard that they can charge more for advice than they can for tax stuff. So um, soapbox topic aside, so far we've talked about like a bookkeeper or someone to help you assemble the numbers. We've talked about a tax accountant who can put together the tax return. And then there's the people like me. Um, my job is to not to put the numbers together, not to lodge tax returns. My job is to help you make more money. My mm-hmm. job is to help you get towards your goals. Um, there are people who call themselves a virtual CFO or fractional CFO and CFO he stands for chief financial officer, which is a you know, fairly high up position in a big corporate business. But like the idea of a virtual one or a fractional one is that like you can get strategic level advice for a fraction of the price or like you've virtually got a CFO on your team, but not really kind of thing. Um, or the people like me call themselves a profits coach. Actually, I haven't found anyone else who uses that title, but basically the idea is like the numbers are telling you what's wrong with your business or what is going right with the business. Um, it's like the dashboard on your car. It's like, as you're driving along, you look at the speed, you look at the temperature, you look at whether your fuel gauge is going down. Like it's really useful information when you're driving a car, but most people don't treat the numbers in their business that way, even though it provides the same enormous amount of value. Like you couldn't drive without the dashboard on the car. You'd get booked for speeding, you'd run out of fuel, the temperature would go up and the engine would blow up while you're driving. But you can actually have the numbers in your business be that level of value to you. And that's partly where people like me come in. Mm -hmm. We point out out those things, we diagnose it, 
Um, and then in my particular case, I like business coach you on the step-by-step -step instructions on what to do about it. Um, so it's like, okay, your revenue is going down, your marketing returns are not so good, and uh, your profit is going down as well. Like sometimes that's the end of what people will tell you. And then the good people will say, all right, here's what you need to do about that. Let's go through your marketing. Let's look at the different channels and what returns you're getting. Let's cut this, let's cut this and reinvest the money over in this one. That will fix your revenue. And then the really, really helpful people will say, okay, here's how you cut that channel. You may need to fire a particular team member who's managing that channel. It's like, okay, how do we do that? How do we hire a replacement who's gonna work in the other channel that you're doubling down on? So there's kind of levels here that I've talked through. You've got the bookkeeper, you've got the tax account, and then you've got the advisors, uh, the people who say what it means and what to do. So like strategic advice, business coaching, how to drill down to numbers, how to understand the numbers and how to act on them. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's true. I mean, certainly the experience I've had, there's a lot of admin to do and that's kind of bookkeeping. And then you do need some an accountant to pull together the figures and do your VAT return, et cetera. And then you do need someone who preferably will help you be a sounding board and understand those numbers yeah. and there are they're yeah, different exactly. they are they are different roles yeah. so what do yeah. you think i got another question what how do you make sure that a business doesn't run out of money what should you be what do we mean by running out of money to begin with <laughs> and what do we mean by stopping it yeah yeah absolutely so and what are the warning signs that you are running out of money the warning signs that you're running out of money. Um, there's quite a few, but uh, one is a horrible feeling in the pit of your stomach and waking up screaming at night and just general signs of stress and tension. Uh, for a lot of people, it's like, you know, I don't know if I'm going to be able to pay that bill. I don't know if I'm going to be able to pay payroll. Oh my God, I've got a big bill coming up from my supplier. I don't know if I'm going to be able to do it. Like that feeling of uncertainty is a very bad sign. Um, and that's generally like, what does it mean for a business to run out of money? It's like there is a bill coming up and you do not have the money to pay for it in the bank account. You have maxed out credit cards. You cannot get a loan. You cannot borrow from friends. It's like there is a bill coming up and you're done. Um, technically, uh, it's called insolvency. Is this idea that you cannot pay your bills when they fall due. And that's when all sorts of things start coming into play. that are a little bit technical. But basically, any debts that you incur while you are insolvent like if your business can't pay its bills and you keep you know you order something from a supplier the supplier can then sue you directly and get to your assets it doesn't matter if you've got some company legal protection like it's messy um, mm -hmm. so you don't want to do it um, as well as like running out of money it feels like failure it sucks your business could have grown and it doesn't you beat yourself up and maybe you run up some debt and then you got to go get a job and try and pay it back it's like it's not good so earlier warning signs that you're running out of money is like just simply checking your bank balance once a week or once a month and noticing if there's a trend. Um, keeping an eye on our customers, you know, you're getting payments from customers or from Amazon or wherever, and then how much of that money is going straight back out again, how much of it kind of hangs around. Like they're very, you know, for people who hate numbers and spreadsheets and things, it's a very simple way to keep an eye on your money. There is a system also called uh, Profit First uh, by Michael McCallowitz, and it's this idea of money comes into your bank account, and then twice a month you transfer it to different bank accounts, and from those bank accounts you can spend whatever money is in them, but once it's gone, like that, that's it, you can't spend anymore. So, um, for example, you know, money comes in and then twice a month you will put some of it into a stock bank account or you put some of it into a marketing bank account and then throughout that month all you got to do is keep an eye on the marketing bank account and as you spend it down you'll be like oh okay I'm almost running out of money um, okay money's gone I can't spend any more on marketing that's one way to not actually run out of money because in this system some of the money goes to a savings bank account and you are not allowed to spend out of that one okay um, there's also an emergency rainy day one. So something to, to dig into for people who don't like looking at spreadsheets but want a simple system. And then the better, more grown up thing to do when you have a bigger business is to actually have a cash flow projection um, or a budget, which is a spreadsheet that shows you money coming in and going out over the coming six or 12 months. 
And so that you can see if you make a spending decision now to order X amount of stock, you can see, is that decision going to send me broke in the next 12 months? Should I perhaps order a little less? Um, new marketing opportunity comes up or potential to hire some rock star from a competitor. You're like, oh, do I have the money to hire them? Well, yes, there's money in my bank account now, but what about later? Because I've got tax bills and stock bills and things in the next three months. Uh, am I going to have enough money? Can I make that commitment right now to hire this rock star? And that's where a cash flow projection comes in and is very helpful. You probably need an advisor to help you put that thing together, but if they're good, it won't be rocket science to maintain or to use it to make decisions with. Okay. Does that make sense? That does make sense. So I think it's been very helpful. I think I've learned a lot. I need to go back and look at my business properly. Um, <laughs> last, as we all do. Um, last question. What are you nerdy about? It can be anything. For, it, it Films, varies. books. I, I, had a, I had a Doctor Who phase. Ooh, um, a Whovian. But, yes, it lasted a while. I was a big fan of the... Um, David Tennant, Doctor. Just, yeah, that, that was my thing for a few years. You're a little bit old for that. Uh, maybe. But that's, <laughs> that's all right. Maybe. <laughs> if you're a self-aware individual, maybe. <laughs> I was always more of a Star Trek man. Yes, yeah, my wife got me into Star Trek, actually, uh, a few years ago. Um, I haven't actually watched anything new because we kind of ran out. We binged all of the Star Treks that we were interested in watching and now it's like waiting for the next movie or something. Well, I don't know. I've watched a lot of Star Trek over the years and I I, I, I prefer Star Trek to Star Wars. I've never been much of a Star Wars fan. But I... Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, sorry, is that bad? Is that bad? No, no, it's just like... You did ask before we started recording, recording for nothing controversial, and then you oh, went sorry, out, and out with that. Oh my god! <laughs> oh mind. yes, that's a good point. That's a good point. Uh, you know, uh, I'm sorry. Yes, that is a controversial opinion. I'm, I'm really sorry about that. Um, <laughs> that's right. I'm, I'm I, sure all the Star Wars fans forgive you. <laughs> yes, yeah, so there's a lot of there's a, of which are legion, I think. Um, yes, and uh, and presumably. Um, I'm going to wake up with paint daubed on my front door <laughs> or something. Or he walks or something. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Um, okay. That's cool. You know, I shouldn't, I shouldn't, I, that was, sorry, my comments were slightly judgmental. I shouldn't have been judgmental. No problem. <laughs> but it's been lovely talking to you. Thanks so much for sharing your insights.